Hello. Welcome to another segment of the Turtus Pavlov Project. In this particular segment, I'm going to talk about how the work of uh, Ivan Pavlov is relevant to music. This may seem like an absurd question. After all, what's famous about Pavlov's work is that he conditioned dogs to salivate in response to a bell that had been paired with meat powder, or that's how the story goes. Turns out Pavlov didn't actually use a bell, but the general scheme is correct. That is, Pavlov studied how stimuli that previously were not effective in eliciting salivation can come to do so after such a stimulus is, is uh, paired with uh, the presentation of food. And uh, the extent or contribution of Pavlov's work is, is not fully appreciated because who cares about whether dogs salivate or not? In fact, uh, Bernard Shaw, uh, in one of his uh, writings, poked fun at Pavlov for discovering something that people really didn't care much about. And interestingly enough, B.F. Skinner picked up on that uh, and was not a great fan of uh, Pavlovian conditioning in the sense that he, he thought that uh, Pavlovian conditioning was only relevant to reflexes and to aspects of behavior that don't represent the richness of human experience that we are all interested in. Well, I beg to differ from these kinds of uh, opinions. In fact, Pavlovian conditioning is, is highly relevant to the richness of human experience. And uh, there are two things that dogs learn when they come to salivate in response to a bell or a tone or a a Pavlov actually used a car horn and a metronome. And that's kind of cute, isn't it? From the standpoint of music, he used the ticking of a metronome as a signal that food would be presented to the dogs and the dogs uh, salivated in response to the metronome. But there are two things that are important about his work and they have nothing to do with salivation. First of all, Pavlovian conditioning is the primary mechanism whereby we learn emotional responses to things that initially don't evoke those responses. Well, there are lots of those kinds of things and actually the richness of human experience is constitutes, uh, consists of the richness of our emotional lives, and our emotional lives uh, are, are so rich, and there are a wide range of emotions elicited by a wide range of stimuli, by, by perfumes and tastes and uh, beautiful art and ugly buildings and <laughs> there are other kinds of emotions. And of course, a big, huge one is fear. Uh, where there's, people suffer from all kinds of fears and anxieties, and much of that is due to learning, and the primary mechanism responsible for that is Pavlovian conditioning. So Pavlovian conditioning is a basic process by, whereby we learn emotions. So those dogs, well, they, learn, they learn to salivate in response to the sound of the metronome, they also learn to love the metronome. <laughs> that is, you condition positive affective reactions in that particular case. If the uh, unconditioned stimulus, or the, if instead of food you use something else, I mean, there are ads on TV about how uh, a, a guy is excited about the particular way that his wife smiles. Well, there's nothing inherent about her smile that's so special. Her smile has become associated with other positive qualities and comes to evoke an emotion for the husband that uh, the same stimulus uh, doesn't evoke in other people. So a lot of aspects and a lot of the richness of human attraction and love involves Pavlovian processes. Uh, related to that are associations that uh, evoke uh, memories. Pavlov really was the, one of the early and 
major contributors to our understanding of how associations are formed and what are the mechanisms of learning and unlearning associations. And uh, uh, when we talk about an association, what we're talking about is a linkage in the brain, in the nervous system, between two events, A and B. And once such an association or linkage has been created, then the presentation of stimulus A is going to evoke the memory of B. So uh, music not only acquires emotional properties because of its association with the circumstances under which the music is experienced. So, so, uh, so romantic couples often talk about having a favorite song, but there's nothing inherent about that song that's so great, but it's a song they might have heard uh, on a special trip, on their honeymoon, or on their, on their first date, or a special circumstance, and it's an association with that special circumstance that makes that song so special, such that when you hear the song, it, it, it activates memories about uh, that event. That's all Pavlovian. The other thing that uh, these dogs learn in these salivary conditioning experiments are expectancies. The dog learns to love the metronome and he learns to expect that food is going to occur at the end of the metronome or a few seconds into the metronome. And expectancies are really critical in music. Uh, mu in music, expectancies are created by predictable patterns, and those predictable patterns lead to associative structures that uh, lead you to ex expect certain notes as appropriate as the next note, and other notes as not appropriate. And these expectancies govern your, your expectation of what the pitch of the next note will be, and they also lead to expectations of, of rhythmic structure or when the next note is going to occur. So let me illustrate the expectancy part uh, in uh, a few bars of uh, the Quran from the second suite by Bach. Uh, you know that your expectancies are satisfied when the note sounds right. You know that your expectancies are violated when the note sounds incorrect. So, and those expectancies are based on the preceding notes. So see if you can pick out the wrong note <laughs> in this sequence. <laughs> That last note wasn't right, was it? How about this? That sounds better. The sequence of notes creates an expectancy that you're going to hear something like that. Uh, one reason modern music is not as pleasant to listen to, at least I don't think so. I guess opinions differ on that. It's really hard to develop these expectancies, and so there's a lot of unexpected stuff that happens. And uh, to some extent, musical interest is uh, created by playing with expectancies and kind of confirming them or disconfirming them. Uh, but if uh, every note is unexpected, it's not music. I can uh, program a computer to generate a sequence of pitches of different durations that are randomly selected. So both the pitch and the duration are randomly selected and play you a 10 minute piece and it's going to sound horrible. Okay, because you can't develop the expectation. And I mentioned you can also develop expectations based on rhythm. So here is a, a, a uh, at the end of this piece, it ends like this. So it's a series of uh, 16th notes followed by the last note. When I play this, I, I like to delay the occurrence of the last note. And uh, the, that delay sort of tweaks your expectancy mechanisms in, in the sense that you want the note to be there, it's not quite there, and when it arrives, you actually feel better. 
and uh, uh, performers do that kind of stuff all the time, and that's one of the ways in which performers play with your emotions. <laughs> That was an extreme version of that. Okay, so uh, here is uh, the Courant from the second of the Bach cello suites. Played, uh, I was gonna say correctly, or played without any uh, intended wrong notes. There may be some. <laughs> but with some variation in timing so that uh, you can uh, enjoy when a note actually arrives. <laughs> 